Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. This is Ben Keezer with Applied Flow Technology, and I would like to thank each and every one of you for joining me today in our webinar on the topic of you should combine your pipes. And the content of this webinar is primarily geared towards AFT impulse uh, because this is where it's most necessary to combine your pipes and you will very soon learn exactly what I'm talking about. So uh, I'm going to jump into this here uh, really quickly. The uh, PDF of the presentation is provided for you for any of those that are listening in live so you can have access to the slides. If you're listening in to the recorded version, then please feel free to email me at benkeiser at aft.com. That's B-E-N-K-E-I-S-E-R at aft.com. And I'll be happy to send you the presentation as well. So that way you can uh, send it around and have it for a really good reference. Okay. So what is the ultimate goal for today? Well, this is a very, very, very common uh, tech support issue that we see a lot of times where perhaps you might have built your model first in AFT Fathom. And in AFT Fathom, you have explicitly modeled all of your various pipes and junctions. You've got your elbows, uh, your valves. Let me change the pipe color there. I don't know why it chose gray. That doesn't make any sense. Uh, so we try this again. Okay, uh, so you got elbows, maybe you have some valves, an orifice plate, an area change. Uh, we have a whole bunch of junctions scattered all throughout the model that will identify where each of these fittings are occurring, and the fittings represent a point loss. That's all it is, is it's a mathematical point where we apply a K factor in order to properly account for the pressure loss across the fitting at some point in the pipeline. So this is certainly a very fine way of being able to uh, model your piping system. And uh, this could be done in AFT Fathom. And then later, you could actually import your AFT Fathom model right into AFT Impulse, where the system is already built for you. Now, the thing is, when you import a Fathom model into Impulse, several junctions are not going to come in as the same junctions that they were before when you were using AFT Fathom. For example, elbow junctions uh, and orifice plates. Elbows and orifice plates do not actually exist as junctions in AFT Impulse. And that is intentional. And one of the reasons why, if I... Uh, zoom in here a little bit. If you look, uh, this pipe right here is simply a connector pipe to an expansion where the pipe goes into an 18 inch diameter. This pipe right here is a very short piece of pipe. It's only two and a half feet long. And <clears throat> the trouble is in AFT impulse, if elbows and orifice plates and whatnot existed as regular junctions, people would be more inclined to use them in their models. And it leads to potentially uh, very unnecessarily long model run times. And uh, that's a, a real headache because a lot of times when we're doing tech support, people will email us in model files that have run times of you know, several hours. And that's just completely unreasonable. If you have a model runtime in AFT Impulse that's anything longer than 30 minutes or maybe an hour at most, you're doing something wrong. <laughs> if, if that's what you're working with, then you're not modeling your system properly. The only time where you would have an extensively long model runtime would be when you're at the very, very end of your water hammer analysis. And you've already got a really good handle of the results. And then at that point, you're really fine tuning things. So th that's where 
you can deal with a longer runtime. But when you're first running your models and you're doing your initial runs, those long runtimes are just unnecessary. So the question is, is all this detail really necessary? So if you bring this model in from AFT Fathom, is it really necessary to keep junctions in all these different places with a K factor to model your losses throughout the system? Well, the answer is not necessarily. You really don't need all that detail. <clears throat> and I'm gonna show you how you can easily modify your model in AFT Impulse such that you can avoid really long, uh, unnecessary model run times, and you can still achieve very solid results. So that's what we're uh, looking at, trying to uh, focus on today. Now in the uh, slides here, I did include some direct links to several video tutorials regarding AFT Impulse that are really helpful. So be sure to watch these. Um, these are actually all videos that I created, and there is a intended order where the best way to view all the videos is in this order itself that everything is laid out. So I would start with the videos here on the left-hand side. If you've never seen AFT Impulse before, and then these videos on the right-hand side will help you really understand how to use the powerful graphing capabilities of AFT Impulse for your models. So if you haven't had a chance to watch those video tutorials yet, be sure to do so when you have a chance. Excuse me. All right. So before we get into talking about pipe sectioning, I just want to identify really quickly the fundamental equations that AFT Impulse is solving. So we have the transient mass balance equation and the transient momentum balance equation. And uh, these are all of the uh, nomenclature for the parameters. And so these are the two fundamental equations that AFT Impulse is solving all throughout the piping system. Now the way that AFT Impulse solves this is by using the method of characteristics. So let's consider a pipeline with a certain length. It's connected to a reservoir on one end and a valve on the other end. The way that AFT Impulse works is it's going to it's going to use the method of characteristics, which is simply a new, it's a type of numerical method that is used to solve your system of the transient mass and momentum balance equations. So one of the key things that AFT Impulse does with the method of characteristics is it's going to break the pipe up into uh, pieces. We call those pieces sections. So where x equals zero, that would be the inlet of the pipe right here at the reservoir, and x equals L would be at the outlet of the pipe, which is connected to the valve. So we take that pipe and we break the total length into equivalent sections and equivalent pieces. So that's the first thing uh, that AFT Impulse does is it's going to section out all of the pipes. Now, why does this do that? Well, the reason why is because if we're modeling a sudden valve closure right here, where we close the valve suddenly, we're gonna see a large increase in pressure at the valve. Well, that sudden increase in pressure is going to communicate itself back to the upstream part of the system. So the key thing is, at any given time step here, the mass flow rate, the velocity, the pressure at any of these different uh, pipe stations is not going to be the same. And that's where you need a good uh, numerical approach like the method of characteristics to be able to track what's going to be happening inside your pipe over time. So we have all of our uh, computation stations. The computation station is simply a specific point where we're gonna do a pressure and flow rate calculation. So we have uh, the, uh, the goal here in this example is we wanna calculate what the pressure is 
let's call this x equals i. That's the middle of the pipe. Let's say that's right here. And we want to calculate what the pressure and flow rate is at that point at the first time step. How is this done? Well, the way that it's accomplished is simply by taking the uh, values for the previous time step at the upstream pipe station and the downstream pipe station. Those are used to calculate the conditions at our uh, station that we're doing a calculation at at the current time step. So here are the uh, fundamental equations again where they're broken down a little bit further. So we combine the mass amounts, momentum equations, and we do some calculus. And what we're going to do is we're going to integrate along what is called this characteristic line. So we have two characteristic lines. This is the characteristic plus line, and this is the characteristic minus line. So that's how we're able to solve this equation here, which is simply uh, solving explicitly for the new pressure and new flow rate at the next time step at a certain pipe station. And that is based upon the previous time steps upstream and downstream stations. So that's the beautiful thing about the method of characteristics is it doesn't have to do any iteration. It solves the equations explicitly. So you can solve this equation directly for pressure or for the mass flow rate at point P. And this is what allows a really good calculation for accounting for water hammer in the piping system. So uh, that's the first thing I want to talk about is that AFT Impulse is taking this total pipe and it's breaking it up into bits so that it can simply solve the transient mass and momentum balance equations and they're solved for explicitly. So if I wanted to solve for the uh, pressure at this point right here, this is the fourth time step. So the way that I would calculate that value is simply based upon the pressure and flow at the previous time step based upon the upstream and downstream pipe stations. And I would just use the characteristic lines uh, like before, and that way I can calculate what all the conditions are at this particular pipe station at that time step. So uh, the grid works really nicely on that. Now, how does AFT Impulse go into sectioning all the pipes? We're gonna talk about that in a minute, but what I wanted to illustrate here is the numbering convention that AFT Impulse is using, and it is really important to get a good understanding of this so that you can understand the results of what you're looking at. So here we have a pipe, just like we looked at before, and we've got computation stations on the top, and then we have sections on the bottom. So the computation station, Sorry, I the computation station is a specific point where we're doing pressure and flow calculations with a method of characteristic grid. A pipe section is simply between a uh, to a boundary between the upstream and downstream uh, computation section or stations. So the key thing here is that your pipe sections have a finite volume and then the computation stations are mathematical points where we are doing the calculations along the pipeline. And this is how things are numbered in AFT Impulse. So if this computation station here, point number three, represents the middle of the pipe. If I want to see how the pressure and flow rate is changing at that particular station, I would need to look at the results for station number three, either pressure or flow rate or velocity, et cetera. So understanding how the pipes are broken up into sections and the numbering of the stations and how that works is really important. Uh, station zero is always going to be the inlet of the pipe and you're gonna have the same number of stations as you do the number of sections. So you can see here how some other examples would show how things are numbered. So this particular point here is gonna be the branch junction. So we could look at either pipe one, station two, 
we we want to see the pressure and flow rate at that location or we could look at pipe two station number four so this would be the inlet of the pipe in that particular case uh, maybe so flow is going this way perhaps or we could look at pipe number three station zero which would be the inlet of this pipe so any of those three stations would tell me what's exactly happening at the location of this particular branch junction. <clears throat> Another concept that's important to understand is communication time. The communication time is simply the amount of time it takes for a sudden transient event to tell the rest of the system that it's there. And it's governed by this equation. The communication time is equal to, or it's equal to two times the pipe length divided by the wave speed. And so any event that occurs less than that communication time is gonna be considered instantaneous. So here's some examples. Here's our good old uh, pipe again. And what I've done is I've created a simple table where I have specified the wave speed directly and so this is not a unreasonable number for the wave speed the wave speed is typically thousands of feet per second so that's a very reasonable wave speed that you might see <clears throat> if we have a 200 foot long pipe i simply did the communication time calculation and we have a communication time of 0 0.1 seconds so what that means is if i was to slam this valve shut I'm gonna have a sudden increase in pressure at the valve. So the amount of time that it takes for a pressure wave, just like a tidal wave, to communicate itself off of this reservoir and then to reflect back is what communication time is. So when you are considering shorter pipe lengths, I mean, this makes it really uh, clear to understand that the pressure waves are passing through your system very, very quickly. And the shorter the pipes, the, the less your communication time will be. Now let's say that I'm closing this valve in two seconds, and I wanna see what happens after uh, 10 seconds, and maybe there's a downstream pipe connected to that valve. And this downstream pipe right here is very, very long. Maybe it's 200,000 feet long, that's about 38 miles. Well, if I'm closing this valve instantly, <clears throat> and I only want to do a transient simulation for 10 seconds, the amount of time it takes for the pressure wave after the valve to communicate itself down and then come all the way back is going to be 100 seconds. So what that means is I can essentially neglect that whole portion of the system because any pressure waves that have gone down and back, they're not going to be communicating with what's going on above. So uh, communication time is really useful to understand uh, how long it's going to take your pressure waves to pass through a system and bounce back. All right. So how are your pipes going to be sectioned into AFT impulse? Well, first of all, you're not going to specify directly what the time step is. It's not something that you can enter or change. The way that the, the time step is determined is by how your pipes are sectioned in the system. So your pipes are sectioned and your time step is chosen based upon your wave speed and your pipe length. So the way that we determine what your time step is, is it gonna be based upon the shortest pipe in your system. So the time step is simply the length divided by the wave speed of your shortest pipe. That's going to establish the maximum time step. Why do we use the shortest pipe? Because we wanna make sure that there's enough resolution uh, that your time step is in the end small enough to capture how fast these pressure transients are passing throughout your entire system. So once we calculate the uh, time step, which is going to be based upon one section in your controlling pipe, then you can section all the rest of your pipes themselves. So the way that we calculate the rest of the sections is the length of any pipe divided by its wave speed 
divided by the time step. And that's going to establish the total number of sections in every pipe all throughout your system. I hope that you all are paying attention because this is really important and this is going to save you a lot of time. Let's consider our long pipeline and let's say that it's 10,000 feet long. If I put a pressure gauge right here where this pressure gauge is 10 feet down from the uh, supply reservoir, this is clearly the shortest pipe in my model. So the way that Impulse is going to section your pipes <clears throat> is it's going to assume one section in that controlling pipe. So that section is going to be 10 feet long. So what it does is it takes the 10 foot long pipe and it divides it by the wave speed and that calculates the time step, which is maybe three or four milliseconds perhaps. After it calculates the time step, then it's going to determine how many sections are in the long pipe. Well, simply by inspection, you can see that if your shortest pipe is 10 feet long and your longest pipe is 10,000 feet long, in this long pipe, you're going to have a thousand sections in that pipe. And each section is going to be 10 feet long. Imagine how many sections you would have if this short pipe right here was only one foot long. Well, if you reduced your short pipe down to one foot long, you're going to have 10,000 sections in your long pipe. If this was six inches long, then you're going to have even more. So the key thing is the more sections that you have in your pipes in your model, the longer your run times are going to be. Why is that? Well, that's because it's requiring more and more computation stations. So if I back up a few slides here, if I back up to the grid here, if I put 10,000 sections in that pipe, that's going to be 10,000 calculation stations all along the flow path. And then based upon the time step, if we're running uh, the simulation for 10 seconds and our time step is five milliseconds, that's going to be a lot of data points. So again, the more sections you have, that's going to lead to more computation stations in your system. The more computation stations, the longer the run time. The moral of the story here is that pipe sectioning has the biggest impact on runtime more than anything else. So what you want to try and do is take your shortest pipe in your system and either neglect it completely and just remove it from your model. <clears throat> then you're only dealing with a 10,000 foot long pipe or maybe make this a little bit longer. Maybe make it 100 feet or simply lump it in with the downstream pipe perhaps. So there's reasons why you can get away with that. Uh, one of the reasons is pressure loss itself. So let me go to the uh, um, pen tool right here. Uh, if we consider the pressure loss in a pipe, uh, Darcy Weisbach, uh, you're looking at uh, diameter to the fifth power versus length to the first. So your diameter is going to have a much, much bigger impact on pressure loss. I might have that fraction wrong. Uh, I can't remember off the top of my head. Uh, it would be reversed, FL over D. <laughs> Sorry about that. So it would be uh, L over D to the fifth. There we go. So uh, the uh, pressure loss is much, much more dependent upon diameter than it is on length. Length just doesn't matter. So as long as you specify <clears throat> your diameters correctly, then making your lengths a little bit longer, it's not going to add that much pressure loss to your system. And the thing is, for calculating the time step, as well as the number of sections, diameter is not even considered in there. So keep those lengths a little bit longer. And that is one way that you can help avoid uh, long run times. The other reason is the amount of time it takes for a wave 
to travel through a pipe and back. Again, communication time. So if I've got a 10 foot long pipe here, the amount of time that it takes for a wave to pass through that pipe is very, very small in comparison to the long pipe for it to go forward and back. So that's the other reason why you can tend to either neglect your shorter pipes or you can make them a little bit longer. In the end, if you make your pipes a little bit longer, yes, you're gonna have a little bit extra pressure loss in your system, but overall, this is not gonna make a huge impact on your model results. And you could even go to the optional tab on your pipe windows and change the design factor. So if you're making your pipes a little bit longer, you can use design factors less than one to reduce your frictional losses a little bit as well. Okay. So again, uh, the uh, more sections you have, the more computation stations. And here's the thing. Uh, when we go to section the pipes, it's rarely going to result in a whole number of sections in each pipe. It's not possible to have a fractional amount of a section. So what we need to do is we need to round off the computing sections so that there's a whole number of sections in every pipe throughout your system. The way that we do that is by modifying the wave speed. And this is the wave speed equation here. <clears throat> the wave speed is based upon several parameters, bulk modulus of elasticity of the pipe, bulk modulus of elasticity of the fluid, that's your K and E values, You've got your Poisson ratio, uh, density, uh, the restraint type, et cetera. So the wave speed is made up of several different parameters. And traditionally, the wave speed is understood to be one of the least certain parameters because of all those terms. So uh, when we are changing the wave speed, it's going to introduce some error into the sectioning. So the traditional approach is to modify the wave speed and allow the error in wave speed to be changed by up to plus or minus 15%. Uh, and that's, that's very reasonable. And just because you have plus or minus 15% error in wave speed, that does not translate directly to error in the model itself. So in the uh, section pipes window in Impulse will do all this for you. And here's what that looks like. Uh, well, you'll see it in a minute. <laughs> so again, I'm going to drill this over and over. The Your runtime in your model is directly rated to the number of computations. More computations and more sections leads to more time steps. And so the more calculations you have to do, the longer your runtime is going to be. If you were to, instead of using one section in your controlling pipe, and you instead doubled it, that's gonna to lead to four times the number of computations because your time step has to be cut in half. So keep that in mind. If we're comparing that 10 foot long pipe to the 10,000 foot long pipe, and we wanna go from one section in that 10 foot pipe to two, then every pipe would be cut into five foot sections. <clears throat> that's gonna make your model run four times longer potentially. So again, sectioning is a big deal here. So uh, here's what the section pipes window looks like in AFT Impulse. And I'm, gonna, I'm actually gonna go ahead and show you this in the model itself. So uh, this is a model that um, you've probably seen before. It's a simple valve closure example. So let me go ahead and pull that up here. So in this particular system, I have a liquid surface elevation of 500 feet. And then my valve is discharging at zero foot elevation. And inside that valve, what I have done is I have checked the box to use exit valve. This is simply the ambient conditions that you're discharging into. So if you're just discharging straight into the atmosphere, then your exit pressure is gonna be zero PSIG. So that's what my uh, reservoir and my valve look like. If I open up my pipe here, this pipe is 2,000 feet long. So I've got a 2,000 foot long pipe. And as you can see, the wave speed, you know, it's a regular 20 inch diameter pipe 
standard schedule material. I, it calculates my inner diameter, wall thickness, modulus of elasticity, etc. The wave speed here is just under 4,000 feet per second. So if we were to calculate the communication time, we would take two times L divided by the wave speed. So two times 2,000 is 4,000 divided by a wave speed of about 4,000. The communication time is going to be about one second. So the amount of time that it takes for a sudden pressure wave that ca that's caused when this valve uh, slams shut is going to take about one second to reach the uh, reservoir and come all the way back. And I'll show you what that looks like in an animation. So I have to take that 2,000 foot long pipe and I have to break it up into sections. So here's how we do that. I'm going to come down here and I'm going to click on the red status light. That's the yellow brick road for what you need to accomplish for building a model. And I'm going to click on section pipes. Everything else is done. So I'll click on section pipes. And here's our section pipes window that you saw briefly before. So what Impulse is going to do is by default, it's going to search up to five sections in the controlling pipe. <coughs> well, right now, I only have one pipe in my system. So five sections would be 2,000 feet divided by five. And that's going to give me the length of each section. And so what this is displaying here is the number of sections in your controlling pipe. So I have one section, two sections, three, four, five, etc. So it's trying different sectioning options. And if I click on any of those, it's going, once you click on a particular row, that's how many sections you're going to use in that pipe. So if I use one section, <laughs> This is really just going to be the inlet of the pipe and the outlet of the pipe. It's going to give you no resolution at all as to what's going on inside that pipe. It's only considering inlet and outlet. Your time step is going to be half a second. It's not going to be able to accurately capture what's happening in that pipe. So here, instead of doing five sections, I'm going to change this. I'm going to click on 10 sections. And instead of using one section, I'm going to use 10 sections of my controlling pipe. And I'm going to show you the sectioning details here. So once I choose how many sections I want to use, then this is going to give you a breakdown of all the sections in every pipe in your system. So because I only have one pipe, it's, going to, it's 2,000 feet long. My wave speed is about 4,000 feet per second. And the ideal number of sections is 10. Well, in this particular case, it doesn't have to vary the wave speed at all, which is really nice. So there's very, very little amount of uh, wave speed error that's built in. And the maximum error that you would see in this table, if you had multiple pipes, the maximum value for whichever pipe it occurs in, that's going to be displayed here in the summary table. So it's going to tell you which pipe has the maximum error in wave speed and how much it has had to be changed as well as the time step. So here, if I use 10 sections, it's going to use 50 milliseconds as my time step there. All right. So let's go ahead and click OK. And the next thing to do is to specify the transient control. That's how long I'm running my model. Let's, let's do a simulation for 10 seconds. If I want to do a simulation for 10 seconds, I've got 200 data points. That's 200 time steps right here. <coughs> now, this is another factor on runtime is how often you're saving the output. Impulse is going to save the result in an external output file. That way, it's a lot easier and quick and simple to open up your model file. And then it'll, archive, it'll unarchive results from the output file itself. So this does play an impact on how long your runtime is going to be, as well as your output file size. But 
it's a very small player. Um, other things is uh, variable resistance. Uh, that's something I'm not going to talk about today. Another impact on model runtime is not only how often you're saving your results, but which particular stations you're saving in the output file. By default, Impulse is only going to save the results for the inlet and outlet of every pipe in your system. So if you want to save those additional computation stations inside the pipe, you have to make sure that you go in and click on this drop down menu and say all stations. Or uh, you could do user defined number of stations. And so this way it'll save all of the interior computation stations inside your uh, output file. That way you can see everything that's going on inside your system. So I'm going to save all stations in this case. And again, this is an impact on model runtime, but the biggest impact is always going to be pipe section. The more sections, the longer the runtime, everything else is secondary. So I click OK. I'm going to go ahead and run my model. And it runs very quick. So let's take a look at what's going on here. We see a maximum pressure of 854 PSIA. Well, what's really going on? This is not telling me anything about when that occurs or what's going on at that given time. So if I go back to my workspace, I can right click on the valve. And I can say, generate a transient graph for the connected pipe. So let's look at pressure. This is the pressure at the inlet of the valve. So we're looking at pressure versus time. So when I slam that valve shut in one millisecond, which is a lot faster than our actual time step, we have a sudden pressure surge right here at the valve. So if I go and I turn on my uh, crosshair tool, the pressure spikes up to about 666 PSIA, and then within a second it grows to about 673, and then the pressure drops. So the pressure drops down to vapor pressure, we're cavitating. So now, once we start cavitating, this is like balloons popping inside your pipe. So once the balloon pops inside your pipe, you have a pressure spike. And then it drops down to vapor pressure. And then you pop it again and you have a pressure spike. Ultimately, the largest pressure spikes that you see here is due to cavitation. So if you were to compare the instantaneous water hammer equation to calculate this pressure value, <coughs> the actual maximum pressure could potentially be much higher if you have cavitation present. Now, cavitation is a whole separate issue. I'm not going to get into this right here. Uh, and so uh, this just creates a whole bunch of madness. But what I want to show you is how this wave travels through the system. So first, let me show you the visual report. So I'm going to go to the visual report, and I'm going to animate by color how the pressure is changing throughout the system. Let's see here. There we go. All right. Clean this up just a little bit more. Okay. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to play the animation and then watch how the colors change when that valve slams shut. <laughs> that went really fast, didn't it? Let's slow this down. I'm going to go one time step at a time. So here is my valve that slams shut immediately, and it's going to send a very large pressure surge down the pipe. And then that surge is going to reflect off the reservoir, and it's going to come back. And then you're going to see how that pressure surge oscillates back and forth. So I'm going to go one time step at a time. So there's my pressure spike. 666 PSIA, that's right around yellow slash orange, and we're going to watch that large pressure surge propagate through each section. So if you look close enough here, what you can see is little lines. Those little lines represent my computation stations. 
So wherever you see any of those lines, that's a computation station. And then the chunk between the stations, that's my section. And that section has an actual volume associated with it. So I'm going to keep going time step after time step. And now the pressure wave has hit the reservoir. And now the reservoir knows that we have a high pressure downstream. And so it's communicating that wave back to the valve. And this is a low pressure reflection. So look at that dark blue there. So now that we're dark blue, our pressure drops and we have a low pressure reflection back to the reservoir. That's basically at vapor pressure. And then as I keep going forward, we're going to start to see these this popcorning effect where you start seeing these sudden high pressures at weird spots in your system, that's cavitation. So that's where you have a whole bunch of chaotic behavior. Now, I'm not gonna talk about cavitation any further. Let me show you a graph of the uh, pipeline itself. So we looked at the colors. Let's take a look at the animation itself. So I'm gonna do a profile plot. I'm gonna plot the flow path. Here's why you wanna save the stations in your output file. As you can see, there are two options. You can animate using either the output file or the solver. So if you were to go into the transient control window, let me open that up again. And I click on pipe station output. If you were to not save all stations, you will not be able to use the output option for animations. You would only be able to use solver. Now, if you are not saving the results for all stations, you're gonna have a shorter runtime and a smaller file size for your output file, but you can only use the solver. Well, why is the output option really, really helpful? Why would I want to include the results for all my interior computation stations with the output file and have a little bit longer runtime from the get-go? This is why. When I go to generate, when I go to generate this animation here, and I play my animation, look how fast stuff happens. Whoa, that was a whole bunch. What I would want to do is pause the animation and then back up time steps one at a time. So the reason why it's so useful to save all your stations, it's so that you can use the output option here. Because when you need to go in and pause your animation, you can click on the minus sign here and you can back up time steps to see what was going on with all that less chaotic behavior. So here I can just keep backing up uh, further and further and further. And this makes it a lot more clear to see what's going on. That's why. So now I'm gonna go one time step at a time. So instead of color, this is showing you the actual values. So I have my pressure spike and that spike is going to pass all the way up to the reservoir. And then the reservoir sees that high pressure and then it's going to reflect back. And then it's going to reflect negatively. So now everything is at vapor pressure down here as we have the negative pressure reflection. And now we start having some popcorning effects. So we've got vapor volumes that are starting to uh, pop and we've got a whole bunch of cavitating behavior. Now let's do a more realistic valve closure. Instead of one millisecond, let's close the valve in 1.2 seconds. And let's see if that eliminates the cavitation. Well, how do I know if I'm cavitating or not? Well, we can see if we've got vapor volumes and I still am cavitating, but look at the maximum pressure, it's reduced here. So when I use a longer a valve closure, that pressure spike gets to be lower and lower. So 
So this is going to be a much, much more gradual increase in pressure when I close the valve versus the sudden one before. And then we still have cavitation and that's a problem. So again, the, the maximum pressure, once that valve was fully closed, if I right click and I regenerate that plot for the valve pressure, this is much more stable. So here, that pressure gets to be about 600, and then it might go a little bit higher, but that's because we've got cavitation. So uh, this may or may not be realistic. You'd have to do a much deeper analysis of the cavitation itself. Now let's say that I want to take a uh, pressure gauge and put it in the pipe so I can do a measurement. Well, here's where we can do the split pipe feature. So I want to put my pressure gauge, let's call it 20 feet right here into the 2000 foot long pipe. So this is what that's going to do is if I hover over the branch junction and I hold the shift key down, I can click and drag the branch right on top of that pipe and it's going to split the pipe. So I want to put that branch 20 feet down from the uh, supply and click OK. So now I have two pipes. I've got a 20 foot long pipe and a 1,980 foot long pipe. So when I change the pipe lengths, I change my sectioning. So here I have to go in and I have to re-section my pipes. So imagine if you will, if I put 10 sections in that controlling pipe, 10 sections in a 20 foot long pipe is gonna lead to a half a foot section. That's going to lead to a very, very long runtime. Look at the time step here. It's half a millisecond in that case. That's going to lead to a very, very long runtime. So look how many sections there are. There's almost a thousand sections and 10 sections here. And by simply using 10 sections in that 20 foot long pipe, it's going to really uh, potentially make my, my model runtime last a lot longer. So here, I'm just gonna do uh, one. So if I use one, or let's maybe use two. We'll do, we'll do two. So we now have a time step of two milliseconds, and I can see that I have two sections in my 20 foot long pipe, so that's 10 foot segments, and I've got 198 in the long pipe. So that's not too bad. The wave speed really doesn't have to be modified that much. So the error in that is very small. Now we'll just go in here to our transient control. Now, if we were to do default impulse, what you would see is this. You may have several rows of pipes and you don't wanna to have to go through and click on those dropdown menus for every single one there's a much easier way to set all your pipes to include more stations. The way that you would do that is by clicking all and then using this drop-down menu here to change your pipes. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go in here and I'm going to say all. That checks the boxes for both pipes. And then in this drop-down menu, I'm going to set it to all sections. And this is going to change the selected pipes to all stations. Now look at the runtime. It wasn't that long before, but it went from less than a second up to 13 seconds. So you can see easily how adding more and more sections very quickly has a dramatic impact on your model runtime. Okay, so now we'll rerun this here. I do have a question here where somebody had asked, is there any typical value for a K factor that you can assign to a general component to indicate the uh, elbows of a size and thickness? And the answer to that question is yes. And I'm actually gonna show you that in the next model once I finish this one here. So uh, hang on there and you'll see that here in just a sec. All right. 
let's take a look at those uh, results here. So if I go to graph results and my graph control, this is basically going to show you the same thing as before. But now we can see that we have our pressure gauge right up there. So if we want to monitor the pressure at our pressure gauge, this is the location that we're going to look at, and that's how you can easily model a pressure gauge with a uh, branch junction. And you'd probably be wanting to look at this in terms of PSIG, and you would look at static pressure. So here, when I go to start playing the animation, I'm going to go uh, one time. Oh, I'll go ahead and play it. So because I really ratcheted down and used a lot of sections, you can see how gently this goes, uh, this pressure increases. But the reason for that is simply because we're using much, much uh, finer resolution in time step. So rather than using five milliseconds, I'm looking at uh, half a millisecond or whatever it was. So this is where you can see the pressure go negative. That's where we've got cavitation. And we've got a lot of issues. So here, when you use more sections in your controlling pipe, it gives you more resolution so that you can see what's going on in your system. So if I want to plot what's happening at this particular computation station at 1,000 feet, well, if you're including those interior stations, you can go to the transient pipe tab and then expand other sections. And then this is where you can do a plot for that. So here's the plot of that particular station. It's station number 131 out of 198. And again, the major impact there is when I was using that section there, Oops, I clicked on the wrong window. When I used two sections, it went to a 12 second runtime. If I use one section, it reduces that dramatically down to three sections or three seconds. Now, this is for a very, very small system. Imagine if you had a much more complicated network. Okay, let's take a look at a more complicated example now. Now the background for this example that I'm showing you is actually a blog article that I wrote a while back. And so I included a link to that blog article. It's called, You Should Combine Your Pipes. And you can read all about the details of this system. But essentially what I had in that system here was a network where I'm using the isometric grid in AFT Impulse, and I have used actual junctions to represent elbows and filters in my pipeline. So this addresses your question there, where instead of using an elbow, I'm using a general component with a K factor. So if I go in and open up any of these elbows here, I've got a K factor of 0.36. Now, where in the world did that K factor come from? Well, I actually built this model in Fathom first, and then I imported it into AFT Impulse. So when you import it into AFT Impulse, if you've got elbows in your system, it's going to change those elbows to a general component with a K factor, and it's going to be the same K factor as before. The whole reason for that is because Impulse is trying to encourage you to simplify, simplify, simplify. <clears throat> so here's what I have going on in this system. I've got my elbows. I have a filter right here. Uh, and then this particular valve has a CV value of 13,215. And I'm closing that valve uh, about 92% of the way in two seconds. So this closes that valve almost all the way really fast. And that's going to send a pressure surge all throughout the system. Now note, it's not closing the valve completely. So after that valve goes to be almost all the way closed, 
we still have a little bit of flow to these two separate flow paths. And uh, the pressure waves, they're gonna dampen out really quick. So the key thing here is I'm using actual junctions to represent explicitly wherever I'm modeling a change in pipe direction. So here, based upon the way I've built the system, I have all these individual short pipes and that's how I'm modeling my direction changes. So this is where I wanna do my force calculations. So let me go ahead and open up the PowerPoint again to show you my force legs. So I'm looking at a lot of forces. So I wanna see how my transient pressures change throughout the system. And I've got seven force sets, the horizontal leg at the top, the vertical leg, the long horizontal leg here from elbow two to elbow three. And then after the valve closes, I have a T and I'm gonna do a force set from the T to elbow number four, elbow four to elbow five, elbow five to the discharge tank, and also elbow three to the discharge tank here. All right, so that's what my force sets look like. So the way that you specify your force sets is gonna be dependent upon your starting pipe station and your ending pipe station. So to define your transient forces, you go to analysis and then transient control and force output. So here you can see I've got my seven force sets right here. I've named them supply to elbow one, elbow one to elbow two, so on and so forth. So what you would specify first is your starting pipe. So for the first four set, the starting pipe is gonna be pipe number one. That's this pipe right here. <clears throat> and the beginning location is at station zero. So I would specify how far away from my starting station is gonna be the four set starting point. So because this is occurring at the inlet of that pipe, the starting node is gonna be at zero. So when I specify zero feet, then that's gonna be at station zero. This pipe right here is 480 feet long, and I want the force to be calculated right here at the end of the pipe, which is gonna be 480 feet into the pipe. So my ending pipe is gonna be pipe one, and the uh, distance is 480 feet. That's at station number 48. So I've just gone in and I've established all of my forces for all the rest of the force sets there. All right. So now that I have everything all set up, I did do a case where I'm comparing a simple T versus a detailed T. I'm just gonna look at the detailed T case here and I'm gonna go ahead and run the model and we'll take a look at the results. So let's look at some graphs here. Let's see what's going on at the valve. So I wanna see how the pressures are changing at the valve. So if I right click on that guy and I do transient graph for connected pipes, let's look at the pressure. So here's how the pressure changes at the valve when I suddenly close it. So that pressure goes up to about 83 or so PSI and then it dampens up pretty quickly. You can easily do the same thing for all the elbows. So I can right click on an elbow. I can generate a uh, set of pressures at the elbow. So this is elbow number one. Here's elbow number two. so on and so forth. Now I've already created several graphs for all my elbow pressures. So if I wanna regenerate that, I just double click. <clears throat> so there's elbow three, elbow four, etc. And then I wanna take a look at my forces. So if I scroll down here, I've got my force graphs. So these are all my transient forces together. Let's break this down one at a time. So here's the transient force 
in the initial horizontal leg from supply to elbow number one. Here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna collapse this, and then I'm gonna move my graph over. That way we can see what we're looking at. Okay, so this is supply to elbow one. I have supply to elbow two. As you can see, that's a much smaller force. Elbow two to elbow three. This is the big guy. This goes from this elbow to this elbow. That's a really long run of pipe, and that's where I have my valve that's closing. That's going to cause a really large force that's going to try and move that pipe in that direction. And then we have elbow three to discharge, elbow four to discharge, et cetera, et cetera. So those are all my force graphs. Now what I want to do is I want to compare these results to a case where I'm not using any of those junctions to simulate a directional change. So this is where we want to simplify our system. So I'm going to create a new child scenario. I'm going to call this simplify. And in this scenario, I'm going to go to analysis, section pipes, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to click on this button right here to combine the pipes. What this will do is it's going to combine pipes that are of similar diameter, wall thickness, and material, and if we have static components that are not changing, such as elbows or filters, or maybe you have a valve that's not changing at all during your transient analysis. Those are all candidates of pipes that can be combined together with the upstream pipe. So this is going to simplify the system. So I'm gonna click OK. Wow, beautiful. So what that did was, instead of using seven or eight individual pipes, it broke it down to four pipes on the workspace. So here's pipe one. Instead of being several different pipes, this pipe is now a thousand feet long, and that combined the total length of this leg, this leg, and then the next leg up to the valve that closes. So it's a thousand feet long. Also, what it did is if I go to the fittings and losses window, is it it calculated <clears throat> the total additional K factor for the elbow that was here the filter and the elbow here, and it converted that to a total K factor. So it's still accounting for all of the minor losses of the fittings in that pipe, as well as the elevation changes. So in addition, it went to the optimal tab and it automatically created my intermediate elevation profile for me. So this way it can track how the elevation inside that single pipe changes without having to use all those extra junctions. So that's one of the beautiful things that this does when you combine your pipes is that it's going to take any K factors that you've already defined with junctions, it's gonna lump them all together and it's going to make your pipeline, your pipe lengths a little bit longer and it'll do your intermediate pipe elevations. So wherever you see a little red ampersand sign, that means that you've got fittings and losses in that particular pipe. Same thing here. This one, that just had one elbow, but no elevation changes. So now that I have gone through and I have combined my pipes, if I go back into the transient control, I just have to go in and resection things. So what this does is it went through and it kept all my forces and look what it did. It went through and it automatically updated the appropriate uh, start pipes and stations as well as end pipes and stations for me. So again, when you're doing these force calculations in your impulse models, you do not have to put a explicit junction at any directional change simply to be able to uh, do your force calculations. When you combine your pipes, it'll fix and automatically update 
all of your transient forces for you. <clears throat> now, one thing that I need to update right here is this difference uh, from one, there we go. All right, so now if I rerun this scenario, it goes much, much faster. The reason why it goes much faster is because I'm not dealing with those really short pipes anymore. I've combined things. But we wanna look at is the results. So if I right click on this folder, I can load all my uh, pressures at each of the elbows in separate tabs. I can also go in and I can load in my uh, uh, valve. So here's my valve inlet and outlet pressure. Here's the pressure at the elbows. And ultimately what we wanna do is we wanna compare these results with the previous scenario. And I've already done that for you in Excel. So let me open up that uh, Excel spreadsheet here. All right. I'm just bringing that spreadsheet over. Okay. <laughs> Now again, don't worry, in the blog article that I wrote, it contains all of this data. So look how awesome this is. This is the pressure at the valve inlet and outlet. And I broke this down into the several scenarios. Simple T for the complex model, that's where I'm using all the junctions to model my directional changes. This is the detailed T case. And then this is the simple T case for when I combine my pipes detailed T case for when I combine my pipes. So that's the data that we're looking at. And when I went through and I plotted everything together, would you look, excuse me, would you look at that? I'm plotting four sets of data and they are right all on top of each other for every graph. So here's the valve outlet pressure. Here's the pressure at the elbows. Now the reason why this is slightly different is because of the way that the elbows are combined. So when you are using the system where you've modeled the actual directional changes with junctions, that's going to be a little bit different than when you combine the pipes. It's still gonna be the same overall pressure loss in your entire system, but it's gonna be slightly different because when you're combining your pipes, it takes that total K factor and it spreads that K factor out along the whole length of the pipe. But as we can see here, our maximum pressures are still very spot on with each other, virtually identical. So the key thing here is not necessarily the total value itself, but it's the overall magnitude of the pressure, when that time frame occurs, and how, th how the trends for the rest of the pressure results look over time. So when you compare a combined pipe system with a more detailed pipe system, those results are gonna be virtually identical. So as I go through from one section to another, all that information is the same. Here's my transient forces. Again, all of the data sets, they're right on top of each other. So the key thing is, when we're asking the question, do you really need to have your model defined with all of this additional detail to perform a water hammer analysis uh, simply so that you can explicitly identify your directional changes with junctions to do force calculations? You don't need them because you can go through and combine your system just like this and dramatically simplify your model. This will dramatically decrease your model run times and you're still gonna have virtually exactly the same results that you saw before. Again, if I go back into my spreadsheet here, every single force calculation, exactly the same. Why is this the case? It's because my transient force calculations are based upon the computation stations themselves. 
So here, instead of going from junction to junction, I went from station inlet here and figured out what station this point was, and that's the force set from there. And then I went from this pipe station to this pipe station, so on and so forth. So with the way that AFT impulse breaks up all the pipes up into bits and it sections everything for you, it's going to take everything into account properly when you want to do your water hammer analysis and your uh, transient force calculations. So simplify, simplify, simplify. You'll be able to have much shorter run times and still maintain very accurate results, and you'll be glad that you did it. So uh, impulse, that's the name of the game, is simplify as much as you can. Here's where you can find that blog article. Incidentally, if you watch the uh, quick start video and the pipe sectioning video, it talks about that information in a little bit more detail there as well. And uh, it was able to be edited in a lot better detail rather than a, a live broadcast. So if you want a shorter version of, hey, how does Impulse do the sectioning again? Just watch this video. That way you can watch 16 minutes or so versus an hour. Okay. Thank you all very much for your time today. If any of you have questions, please do not hesitate to contact me. You can reach me at B-E-N-K-E-I-S-E-R at AFT.com. And you can also contact our support team and we'll be glad to assist. Thanks everyone. Take care and have a wonderful day.